Hi everyone, my name is Kristen Janui. I am currently a business administration student at National Chengxi University. Today we're going to be speaking about the classical and Keynesian school and we're going to do a highlight on some main distinction. Let's speak about some categories from the classical school. The classicals, 1776. Adam Smith is the main founder. We also find some economists like Jean Baptiste, David Ricardo, etc. The neoclassicals, 1950 to 1970, Carl Leon Alois, Francis Isidro, or some economists. The neoclassicals from 1970 to today, we can find Robert Lucas, Thomas Sargent, Robert Bao, etc. Finally, we find the monetarists, also known as the Austrians, which, which school Friedrich A. Hayek is the main founder. Now, let's speak about the Keynesian school. The Keynesian, was, the Keynesian school was founded in 1936 by John Maynard Maynard Keynes. We later find the neo Keynesian from 1950 to 1970, John Richard Higgs and Franco Mo Digliani are some economists. We find the neo Keynesian from 1979 to today. Morgan Stanley, Irving Fisher, John Boyan Taylor are some economists. And finally, we find the post keynesian which school we find John Benson, Nicola Caldor as economists. Let's speak about some main distinctions between those two schools. Primary time horizon of analytic vision. For the classicals, they base their assumption on the long run. In the long run, prices always adjust up or down to ensure market clearing. The concept was initially explained by the classical economist Jean-Baptiste Say in 1801. The leasing of intervention from government, such as regulating property rights and managing externalities, such as public goods and common resources, the economy will adjust itself in the long run, so the least degree of government intervention is required. And also, the free market economy is highly recommended by the classicals. While for the Keynesian, they, ba they base their assumption on the short run. In the short run, market do not clear. For example, market of goods and services due to nominal price rigidity and labor market due to efficiency wages. Public policy and government intervention required, monetary policy and fiscal policy. A greater extent of intervention in the economy, suggesting a more active role for the government. For example, the current situation of the COVID-19 or the 2007-2008 financial crisis or some short run fluctuations and therefore government intervention is needed. In this article from the Financial Times, it says that because of the COVID-19, UK suffers the biggest drop in economic output in 300 years. So therefore, the, we can see that the COVID-19 do have big impact on economies worldwide. Therefore, the government actions is needed to put the economy back on track. Primary focus of analysis. For the classicals, this is the economic growth that matters. Classical growth theory explains economic growth as a result of capital accumulation and the reinvestment of profits derived from specialization, the division of labor, and the pursuit of comparative advantage. The conclusions of classical growth theory supported the ideas of free trade among nations, individual free enterprise, and respect for the accumulation of private property. Free trade area among countries are highly supported by the classical, such as the ASEANs, which is the Association of the South East Asia nations, the European Union or the NAFTA, which comprise the US, the Me Mexico and Canada, which are some featured areas. They are highly recommended by the class. While for the Keynesian, this is a business cycle. The business cycles are periodic fluctuations of employment, income and output. According to Keynes, income and output depend upon the volume of employment. Most macroeconomic variables that measure some type of income or production fluctuate on a year-to-year -year basis. 
So now let's speak about the primary concentration on GDP. The classicals, they, they base their assumption on the general trend of GDP. In the long run, the aggregate supply curve is vertical at the natural rate of output. This level of production is also referred to as potential output or full employment output. Changes in the money supply affect nominal variables but not real variables in the long run. In the long run, the real GDP is equal to natural rate of output. For the Keynesian, they base their assumption on the fluctuations of GDP. Economists use the model of aggregate demand and aggregate supply to explain short-run fluctuations in economic activity around its long-run trend. First, economic activity fluctuates on a year-to-year -year base. Economic fluctuations are irregular and unpredictable. For example, the COVID-19, no one expected the COVID-19 to come in such a period of time. Changes in real GDP are inversely related to changes in the price level, and the economy is characterized by recessions, upturns, prosperity, and also downturns. The global pandemic is it a treat for economies worldwide. Here in this slide are the G7 countries economies. We can see um, the 2009 was in blue, 2019 is in green and 2020 is in gray as a, as the effect of the covid-19 we can see that this all the numbers in 2020 are negative numbers this means that the covid-19 do have big impact on economies worldwide and in these situations government actions is needed in order to put the economies back on track the emphasized side of economy. For the classicals, this is the supply side. Which comes first, the supply or the demand? This is such a casualty dilemma, such as between the chicken and the egg, which comes first. Jean-Baptiste says now, which is a classical economy, say, supply creates its own demand. Producers and their willingness to create goods and services set the pace of economic growth. The core point of supply side economics is that production, the supply of goods and services is the most important in determining economic growth. In supply-side fiscal policy, the focus is on cutting taxes, lowering borrowing rates, and deregulating industries to foster increased production. In this graph, we can see when there is an increase in supply from supply 1 to supply 2, there is a decrease in the price from P1 to P2. Therefore, supply studies argue that when companies temporarily overproduce, excess inventory will be created. Prices will subsequently fall and consumers will increase the purchase to offset the excess supply. While for the Keynesian, this is the demand side. John Maynard Keynes Law say, demand creates its own supply. Demand side economists believe that the level of demand in the economy is the key driving factor to economic growth rather than supply. Consumers and their demand for goods and services are the key economic drivers. A core characteristic of demand side economics is aggregate demand. Government can generate demand if people and business are unable. In this graph, we can see when there is a decrease in demand from demand 1 to demand 2, there is also a decrease in price from P1 to P2. So demand siders argue that when there is a decrease in demand, prices will subsequently fall. Therefore, the consumers are the ones having the power on price fluctuations. Example, aggregate demand worldwide decreased because of the global pandemic, which also reduces overall prices because people are at home so they cannot um, consume the amount of food and services they used to before the COVID-19 when everything was normal. So therefore, the overall prices also decreased. So now let's speak about the slope of the aggregate supply. For the classical, the slope of the aggregate supply curve is vertical. In the long run, the aggregate supply curve is vertical, which is perfectly inelastic. In the long run, an economy's production of goods and services depends on its supply of labor, capital, and natural resources, and on the available technology used to turn this factor of production into goods and services. The price level does not affect this variable in the long run. 
we can see in this slide this is the long on average supply curve when there is an increase in the price from p1 to p2 this does not change the quantity of goods and services supplied in the long run. The slope of the aggregate supply curve for the Keynesian is upward sloping. In the short run, the aggregate supply curve is upward sloping. Short run fluctuations in output and price level should be viewed as deviation from the continuing long run trend. In the short run, an increase in the overall level of prices in the economy tends to raise the quantity of goods and services supplied. A decrease tends to reduce the quantity of goods and services supplied. They also develop the theories such as the misperceptions theory, the securage theory, and the secure price theory. The securage theory means that the wages are really sticky to adjust in the short run and also the prices are really sticky to adjust in the short run so those contribute contribute in having the upward sloping aggregate supply curve as you can see here the initial price is p1 and the initial output is y1 when there is an increase in the price from p1 to p2 this increase also the quantity of goods and services supplied in the short or one so assumption of monetary neutrality the classical developed the theory of monetary neutrality according to the classicals real economic variables which are real gdp do not change with changes in the money supply Changes in the money supply affect nominal variables, nominal GDP, but not real variables. The irrelevance of monetary changes for real variables is called monetary neutrality. The neutrality of money theory claims that changes in the money supply affect the prices of goods, services, and wages, but not overall economic productivity. The Keynesians do not believe in monetary neutrality. For the Keynesian, the assumption of monetary neutrality is not appropriate when studying year-to-year -year changes in the economy. Keynesians state that as the money supply increases, the value of money decreases. The prices of goods and services will increase in order to reach a point of equilibrium by counteracting the increase of the money supply. Keynesians also argue that an increase in money supply impacts consumption and production because it increases prices. This increase in price alters how individuals and businesses interact with the economy. Effect of monetary policy. For the classicals, no effect on real interest rate. They develop the Fisher effect. The Fisher effect is an economic theory created by economist Irving Fisher. It refers to a one-to-one -one adjustment of the nominal interest rate to the inflation rate. According to the Fisher effect, when the rate of inflation rises, the nominal interest rate rises by the same amount. The real interest rate stays the same. While the Keynesians, they develop the theory of liquidity preference. Keynes developed the theory of liquidity preference in order to explain what factors determine the economy's interest rate. According to the theory, the interest rate adjusts to balance the supply and demand for money. Liquidity preference theory refers to money demand as measured through liquidity. The liquidity preference theory says that the demand for money is not to borrow money, but the desire to remain liquid. In other words, the interest rate is the price for money. We can see here in this article from Forbes, to recover from the COVID-19 in the USA, 618 billion stimulus plans have been released. It will include some for vaccine distribution, some for federal employment benefits, and some other to support business, etc. And people now are wondering if German economy will pull a rope out of the coronavirus crisis. We can see in this graph, which has some fiscal response to the pandemic in European countries. Countries such as Germany, Italy, and Belgium, they were highly invested in the economy in order to put the economy back on track. While some countries such as Greece, Hungary, and Denmark, they 
the, the fiscal response are really small uh, in comparison to Germany or Italy. So based on the comparison we just have, we can say that countries such as Germany, Italy, Belgium, or maybe the United States, they are much more Keynesian because they believe in government actions. While countries like German, like Denmark, Hungary, and Greece, they are much more classical because um, their response are really small in comparison to the other countries. Let's summarize. For the classicals, the assumption is based on the long run, while for the Keynesian, the assumption is based on the short run. Classicals believe in economic growth, Keynesians believe in a business cycle. Classicals base their assumption on the general chain of GDP, Keynesians base their assumption on fluctuations of GDP. The classicals see the, economy, the supply side of economy, the Keynesians see the demand side of economy. For the classicals, the aggregate supply curve is vertical, while for the Keynesians, the aggregate supply curve is upward sloping. The classicals base their assumption on monetary neutrality. Keynesian, they see no monetary neutrality. The classicals believe that there is no real effect of monetary policy, while the Keynesian believe that the, the effect of monetary policy is real. I hope that you learn a lot and thank you for watching.